Welcome. I'm Star Parker. The U.S. Supreme Court has decided that homosexual and transgender individuals are covered by the anti-discrimination provision, Title VII, of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Associate Justice Neil Gorsuch wrote in his opinion, an employer who fires an individual for being homosexual or transgender fires that person for traits or actions it would not have questioned in members of a different sex. Sex plays a necessary and indisguisable role in the decision, exactly what Title VII forbids." Unquote. You know, when I read the reasoning of Justice Gorsuch, I feel a little less surprised by the chaos in our cities and the great difficulties we're having to enforce the law today. How indeed can we expect sanity in enforcing our laws when such confusion exists in our nation's highest courts? about the intent of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. The horrible history of racial oppression and discrimination in America flew in the face of our nation's Declaration of Independence in that all men are created equal. The intent of the 1964 Civil Rights Act was to correct that Americans were being rejected because of how they were created, not because of how they behaved. This was exactly the sentiment Dr. King expressed in his famous dream speech, that his children would be judged by the content of their character and not by the color of their skin. King dreamt that his children would be judged by their choices, not on the condition outside of their control or choice. You know, Abraham Lincoln got to the heart of the matter when he mocked Stephen Douglas's claim that states should vote to decide whether they would permit slavery because this was based on a biblical principle that man has the power of choice. In quotes, God did not place good and evil before men, telling him to make his choice, said Lincoln. On the contrary, continued Lincoln, he did tell him there was one tree and of the fruit of which he should not eat upon pain of certain death. Unquote. Man has choice, but only in a country where there is no standard and conviction of right and wrong does it not matter what you choose. The essence of a free country is allowing citizens freedom to make and be responsible for their own choices. To limit that freedom because of circumstances of birth, biological race, biological sex, is to make a mockery of freedom. But to claim, as Stephen Douglas did, that once given freedom, it doesn't matter what individuals choose, that there is no standard for right and wrong, good or evil, is also to make a mockery of freedom. So now, once again, as with slavery, the court has gotten this condition wrong. They have concluded to expand the Civil Rights Act to include sexual orientation and gender identity. Choices have meaning and consequences. So today on Cure America with Star Parker, that's me, we will talk about some of the consequences of SOGI. That's what it's being called here in Washington, D.C., sexual orientation, gender identity. We're going to talk about the consequences on marriage and family with my prestigious panel and my very special guest right after this important message. If the act passes in its current form as H.R. 5, then every right that women have fought for will cease to exist. H.R. 5 is a human rights violation. Every person in this country will lose their right to single-sex sports, shelters, grants, and loans. The law will forbid ever distinguishing between women and men. Male rapists will go to women's prisons and will likely assault female inmates. Female survivors of rape will be unable to contest male presence in women's shelters. Men will dominate women's sports. Girls who would have taken first place will be denied scholastic opportunity. Women who use male pronouns to talk about men may be arrested, fined, and banned from social media platforms. Girls will stay home from school when they have their periods to avoid harassment by boys in mixed-sex toilets. Girls and women will no longer have a right to ask for female medical staff or intimate care providers. Everything I just listed is already happening. And it's only going to get worse if gender identity is recognized in federal law. Why are conservatives standing with liberals to strip women of their rights? America's women deserve better. Hi, I'm your host, Star Parker, and I'm here with a very special guest on this 
episode of Pure America with Star Parker. Uh, one of the reasons I want to bring up this topic of black privilege is because we're hearing so much about white privilege. Uh, in the news today, with so much cultural chaos going on with the domestic terrorists now elevating the discussions to pulling down statues, we've forgotten what this was really all about uh, after the death of Mr. Floyd. A lot of attention started being placed on the black community, on race, on racism. And so I have a very special guest today because he found some really interesting data about black family life. Uh, Dr. Pat Fagan. Dr. Fagan is a dear friend. Uh, he is a teacher, a social scientist. He's the director at uh, Mary Institute of Catholic University. And he's spoken many times at our clergy uh, summit for Urban Cure. And I want to thank you for being here with me. Uh, the reason I asked you to be with me today is because you did a report. You looked at some data uh, out of the Midwest. And it was really intriguing to see after the dust started settling uh, and people started asking deeper questions about what went wrong, what has broken down, especially on these race questions, uh, you had a fascinating look at family life. I want you to tell us a little bit about it. I want you to answer a couple of questions for me. Can a nation have a civil society without married parents? And I also want you to address our black children being denied the privilege of married parents, which was the question that you raised in your report. You got a couple of questions in there. Let's oh, take yeah. the first one. <laughs> Can a nation have a civil society without many married parents? Yes, but only to a certain extent. If the, I'd call, like we're, a civil society is a society that functions because people belong together enough and agree together on the way to act enough that you actually have a functioning civil society. Okay. Based on freedom. You on, say on enough, it. enough meaning community, family. Yeah, an okay. agreement. Agreements. And okay, this, okay. Is, this is the way we work. Okay. Um, that's what you need to have a civil society. So you've got freedom um, and you have the capacity then to agree and to work together and to fulfill agreements. Okay. Right? Now, such a society actually has an underpinning of the people, the attitudes of the people that are in it, its citizens. And the building block of every society, always, in all of history, is the family. Mm -hmm. Mom and dad coming together, having kids, and raising them. That's universal. Sometimes the family structures are slightly different, one culture to another, over time. But it's a universal that the greater the stability there, the greater the flourishing of the family, of the parents, and of the children. So if you have a breakdown in marriage, okay, you can get along with a certain amount, but it breaks down still more, it gets harder. You break down still more, it gets harder still because the costs increase massively, but also the attitudes of cooperation change. Okay. And talk to anybody in a broken family, that's where mom and dad are no longer together. Biological mom and dad are not cooperating in raising their kids. Uh, there's a lot more grief in such families. And the tendency for things to go wrong and people misunderstanding, the, the, the rates of that increase. The rates of things going wrong increase because a big thing has, re a fundamental structural thing has gone wrong. And it'd be a bit like if you're in your, in your car, if the drive shaft suddenly gets cracked, well, the car isn't going to function the same way. And if you've got lots of cars on the road with drive showers that are cracked, you're going to have lots of blockages on the road eventually. Right. Same in society. And I think that, that we're seeing that. You've seen it in data. We see it in our urban communities. But we're now seeing it in our suburban communities where marriage has totally broken down. Uh, you expressed in your report some of the numbers that were intriguing and alarming. Uh, to look at, in particular, you looked at the Midwest where uh, the marital family, the white community was only about half right there. So it means half of the kids are experiencing what we thought was confined to some of our harder hit communities. But what really captured my attention was when you looked at uh, the Midwest cities and saw marriage rates in the black community at like 17 percent. That was just that was just startling. Well, if you look at it, marriage rates right across the country, I measure them at age 17, okay. when the child is 17, 17 because, years old. yeah, the, the growing up is pretty much over. They're just about ready to leave, mm -hmm. okay? And actually, it's the last year that you can get it from the census data. So both of those things happen to coincide. If you measure how many of our 17-year-olds have grown up 
with mom and dad together, cooperating on raising the kids. Um, for the nation as a whole, only 46%. Oh my. Now, there are married families that that's where normally the father is a new one to join, the mother has the kids. There are fathers who join a family, right. but it's not their kids. So you're that talking about a, husband married to the mother, the children. Yeah, the this two biological. The, two the biological. man who, who right. the man and the woman who caused this child this uh, to come into existence. At That's age like 46 percent, 46 the for the nation as a whole. Wow. Now, if you break that down ethnically, yes. our strongest actually are Asian Americans, yes. then whites, right. then Hispanics, right. then American Indians and Native Alaskans, and then the black family. Right. And the national average for the black family at age 17, only 17 percent of black families, of black teenagers, are living with biological mom and dad. So 17-year-olds, our African-American 17-year-olds, only 17% live with their biological, biological parents. Mom and dad mom in, and the, dad in the same in family. family. Yeah. This, is, um, this is complicated for sure, but I'm wondering if data is showing what some of us have tended to believe about the growth of the welfare state, that we now are looking at these children in criminal activity. Is this contributing to why we have so much lawlessness in the streets? Usually, if a parent, if you have two parents at home, the boy's not running around. Neither are the girls. There are a lot of girls out there doing this damage as well. Sure. Uh, but when dad is there, it seems like there's more social stability for the rest of us. Have you seen any of this in, reflected in data? Oh, yeah, that, that's, that's well known. and. Um... It's very clear that the more there's a breakdown in the family, particularly among boys, the crime rate goes up, particularly in adolescents, and it lasts till about the mid-40s, when all of a sudden testosterone drops in men, and so they become less. Oh, they become less. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Lots of, yeah. Some people say that that's when the police stop chasing no, no. guys, too. No, no, so. it's, 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 good. it's like right about good. 40, it's like, no, no they don't pull me good. over like they used to. It's no, like, I, I, you're driving too slow. But, that's um, right, but you're now, driving too slow. I want to. I don't want to run out of time on getting to some of the solutions. What do we need to do? You're, you know, you're looking at this data. You've been researching for a long time. I've known you for 25 years in this space. Uh, and I'm just wondering, are, when do we start looking at how do we rebuild family? And we only have about 30, 40 seconds, so I have to Okay, well, if I had only, because if I, I had one answer. leadership group, mm -hmm. it's the single black mother who has raised her kids and now realizes it would have been much better for me and for them had I been married. Mm -hmm. The black woman who's single, the single black mother is the one who can lead America out of this. Wow. That is really Because nobody can answer her and say you're wrong. That's right. That's true. Yeah, well, that is true. I uh, have so many more questions. And I think that you should look at the Mary Institute and get this report on black privilege because it expresses not the, just this point, but it talks in general about the breakdown in our society, but specifically in the black community and how we are going to need the churches to help on this question. Uh, it talks aggressively, pastors, about uh, what are you saying over the pulpit? Uh, because chastity just doesn't seem to be getting uh, through to the people that are in these communities so that we don't see such breakdown in marriage, which then leads to more social stability. So I'm going to keep Dr. Fagan with us on our panel. We'll begin to explore this a little bit deeper right after these messages. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, inventor of MyPillow. Thanks to your support, you've helped make MyPillow become one of the fastest growing companies in America. Over the last 12 years, you've helped MyPillow create thousands of jobs right here in the USA. When I got MyPillow, I'm asleep almost immediately. I stay asleep at night, and I wake up more well-rested in the morning. That's why I invented MyPillow. My patented fill adjusts to your exact individual needs and helps keep your neck supported and aligned. I'm interrupting this commercial right now to give you deep discounts, not just on my pillows, but also my mattress topper sheets and so much more. For example, you can get body pillows regularly, $89.99, only $29.99 with your promo code. With our 60-day money-back guarantee, you have nothing to lose. Sleep well, America! For the best night's sleep in the whole wide world, visit MyPillow.com.
Welcome back to Cure America. I have my panel with me here to talk about some of these cultural clashes that we're dealing with today. I mean, my goodness, the list is getting very long about some of the concerns. So I have uh, to address some of them with us today, Dr. William Allen, the Chief Operating Officer of the Center for Urban Renewal and Education, Mr. Henry Olson, Senior Fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center and an opinion columnist for the Washington Post, and Dr. Pat Fagan, a social scientist and director of Mary Institute at Catholic University. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for being with me. Thanks, very uh, Because good. we have a lot to talk about. Uh, earlier, I was talking with Dr. Fagan about a study that he released on marriage rates in the black community. There's so much in the news about white privilege that his organization looked at black privilege to see that what happens when black children are raised with married parents. And we saw that there are some benefits uh, in this area. And so, Dr. Allen, I want to ask you first, because so much is in the headlines. We just saw the Supreme Court rule that LGBTQ should be added to Civil Rights Act. Um, we hear the noise of the street marchers or the domestic terrorists, as I like to call them, because they keep saying that they're about social justice. But family and marriage get a little bit of attention. What did you see? And and uh, gain from the report that Dr. Fagan did? Well, I saw two things right away. One of them reminded me of what often happens when one has a young child, a baby. The baby cries, and you're at a loss to explain why the baby's crying. And so you have to search. And you find always that some particular thing. His research pointed in that direction for me. When we tend today to talk in terms of macro or aggregate statistics, which never explain anything, it is the micro-social statistics within, hidden within the aggregate are details. And that's what I saw in the work that he was doing, for example, when he identified a great deal of dysfunction in the black family in the Midwest, which immediately said to me, this sounds like the historical pattern of migration effect. Whether you're leaving Egypt and you're the Hebrew children, or whether you're leaving Europe to come to the United States and you're Irish or something else, the great migration that took place in the United States in the 1920s move first of all to the Midwest, okay. where the center of this non-intact families is found. And I thought, there's a link here, which if we look, dive into the statistics, we can discover, instead of simply talking about race at the macro level. Right. Well, then, how do we address the uh, family then and breakdown? Because what you're bringing to the table is, OK, the men went first to find work to then bring family later. But I don't know that there's been a place in history where we saw such a insistence on not marrying the mother of the children. And that's one of the things that I saw from your report. I want you to elaborate on it, but Henry, I also want to ask you, I'll let Dr. Fagan elaborate in a minute because we've just heard from him a little bit. I want, I want to hear from you in some of the research that you have seen because you're looking at these ethical questions in your public policy research as well. Uh, there's a tendency, especially from conservatives and the right, to say family breakdown is what's creating a lot of this moral chaos. And now we have a different issue on the table. Can you explain to us where we can find a little truth here? Well, yeah, I think that one of the things we have to recognize is something Dr. Fagan spoke about, which is it's the living with both biological parents that produces the beneficial outcomes. Mm -hmm. And conservatives can learn to talk in that language rather than in some of the language that seems to castigate different types of families that are not traditional married families, mm -hmm. but in which both parents, whether they're divorced or in some other way, actually do contribute actively and responsibly to the raising of their children. And that way, conservatives can make a base on family formation rather than something that would come across to other ears as more theological or dogmatic. And that would be a way to build and gain ground rather than to reiterate a losing position. Well, if it's a losing position, because Dr. Fagan, I've seen much of your work, uh, even in the past, where you show that we should have discussions about chastity in marriage, because it is important uh, that we keep a civil society as a result of those patterns that grow when we have community, uh, because it first starts the passing of virtues in that household. Well, I think the short answer is yes. Uh, but given the modern situation that we're in, where a lot of people, as Dr. Wilson has just said, have different views on sexuality, that where I think things are going is that the there's a, there's a form, a way to form children so that they're going to end up married. Chastity has got a lot to do with it. Not everybody agrees with that anymore. Um, most people do, but not everybody. 
and there are different forms of sexuality that some people are pushing. What I think is needed now, given the Supreme Court ruling, is that the intact married family that worships weekly, that wants to raise the children chastely, be regarded as a sexual group and get the very same rights as every other sexual group is getting, that it not be discriminated against. <laughs> oh my goodness. As actually it is massively discriminated against yeah. in public education. Yes, yes, it is. Yes. And it's interesting, even in the in public square. In fact, I hear a retreat uh, from some of the language about or the both of you. Dr. Allen, I'm just wondering, uh, should we just give in to this notion that what well, people can choose whichever path they want and live and express that in the public square? And then we're just going to carve out all of these special interests for each of the people group. How are we going to solve this? Well, certainly we can't just give in because disorder is not civil order and we have to preserve civil order. But I would like to remind everyone that the Bostock decision, the most recent Supreme Court decision on these issues, didn't create a protected class of transgender or sexual orientation. It was very explicit in the Gorsuch opinion that the male, as a biological male, was not treated without regard to gender, i.e. a female doing what he did would not have been treated the way he was treated. That was the basis of the decision. Right. So they didn't actually create a protected status for sexual orientation in the case. But some are saying that it did open the door now for this Equality Act that's been going through, or actually already passed at the House, and now is going to the Senate for more discussion to say, we're really close now to just saying that you can choose whatever sexual patterns you want to display them in the public square, and religion has to be quiet about these questions. I'm not sure that this is a good idea for us as a civil society, or a society trying to work at least together. I think the thing that we have to, uh, in dealing with the response to Bostock, is recognize the central of the First Amendment in this, which is mm -hmm. that the First Amendment is really an ingenious doc, a short set of words that establishes the freedom to speak, the freedom to write, and the freedom to think, which is what is really enshrined with the freedom of religion, which is a freedom of conscience. And then we have act things that permit our freedom to act on those things, the freedom of free exercise, the freedom to assemble, and the freedom to petition the government. Taken together, what that means is that you cannot constitutionally and consistently with our regime make people confess to something they don't believe in or form in, prevent them from forming institutions to prevent to advance their beliefs. Well, so what that means is that we need to protect that which protects religion, protects the civil society, protects the nuclear family from the discrimination that some are seeking to bring upon them. But we haven't seen that at all. We've seen expansion of government in areas where people don't think government belongs. We yeah. saw in the welfare state, which some say created this opportunity to break down family. When you're paying people not to work or to marry or to um, you know, make quality decisions, uh, then more people tend to move into those life patterns. And on this particular question, we already saw the, the rulings and the, and, the, and the law say that we were going to protect li religious liberties, but yet keep going to the court with a bakers who do not want to bake cakes uh, for specific expressions. I'm just not sure that this question can be settled uh, because it seems like we're talking to world views. So Dr. Fagan, I want to ask you, because you, your work has always pointed to uh, family and tradition. How are we going to maintain uh, a, a civil order surrounding religion and those that want to practice and believe what the scriptures say in a secular environment that now says that we can add all kinds of alphabets to the Civil Rights Act? Well, I don't think the future looks good, to be quite honest, yeah, um, so. because the infrastructure, the intellectual and the legal, mm -hmm. and in turn the constitutional infrastructure is premised on two things. A, a religious people, without any f enforce, uh, forcing people to be religious, but it, it, they were all across the West, mm -hmm. people who are by and large religious, and married those two things are intertwined in the weave and woof of the culture. Mm -hmm. uh, those things have been deliberately targeted essentially since the French Revolution, most particularly since Marx and Engels, and very successfully. That's yeah. another whole discourse. And now you see the fruit of, we now have a society, a culture, not just a society, not just the Constitution of the US, but the infrastructure below it is crumbling. It took, you know, many, it took about a thousand years to move from pagan Rome to the Renaissance mm -hmm. with this gradual 
building of this weave and woof of worship and marriage. Mm -hmm. um, now, people didn't set out to come up with a constitution. They didn't even set up to have a married society. That was a byproduct of a way of living. Right, but so you, if you don't want the way of living, you're right. not going to get this byproduct. And you pointed to your own study that show now 46% are buying into this way of living. I'm, I'm concerned, Dr. Allen, I'm very concerned that if we buy this idea that I'm hearing expressed that, well, this is just the trend of culture, that we could end up uh, with a, a non-religious society, even more so than we are, all of the institutions broken, which is going to open the door for bigger government. So my question becomes, is this a battle worth fighting for the clergy community to say, we want to reverse some of these trends, or should they just carve out space for themselves in a secular society? It's the only space in which moral authority can operate a space in which we say there's no liberty without responsibility, no responsibility without liberty. Mm -hmm. So that it is not the question of ritualizing certain indexical steps towards stability, but holding people directly responsible for their moral judgments and their conduct. But how do you do that without law? Okay, so which came first then? Uh, <laughs> do we have public policy changing behavior, which then changes our, our opinion about that? Or do we have the culture just change those opinions? And then, I mean, now it's getting kind of confused. I've always been the one that finds <laughs> that the law it helps us know how to live, all the way back to the law of God. I mean, my goodness, if he didn't say, don't kill, maybe I'm, I think a few people I would prefer not on this side of eternity. Getting back to some of the things Dr. Fagan said, if we're going to have a free society, this is the sort of thing that has to happen consensually before the laws are formed. It cannot happen by imposition from the law to create a majority consensus that did not exist beforehand. One can create that consensus, but not in a free or democratic way. So that if we want to maintain our freedoms, we yeah. want to maintain what makes America unique, then what we need to do is persuade people and carve out the space to allow us to persuade. Uh, but, uh, uh, doctor, I need to hear from you, Do Dr. Allen, because I think the opposite is what has happened. The people didn't say they wanted this stuff. In fact, we see some cases where the people voted against some of what we're seeing today, and yet they've gone through courts to get what some call the left of ideology. Very exactly correct. I want to give a very brief example of this, referring to the COVID-19 crisis that we've just lived through. Mm -hmm. What have we done? We've struggled with government's ability to persuade us to act a certain way. Right. Social distance, wear a mask, wash your hands. And we pretend that depends on science and technology. Right. We've forgotten that those same things were present in the Levitical Code right. and transmitted securely. Why can we not do what was done in the Levitical Code? Right. Because we've abandoned okay. any expectation that people can be held responsible. Wow. And I, well, then I'm wondering who's to blame. Are the, are the legislators to blame to assume that we don't know yes. how to self-govern? Yes. You're saying yes. yes. So that because yes. I see this in particular in the black community, that's starting with a set of assumptions that these folks don't know how to self-govern. So yes. we must yes. build a society that tries to answer all of these moral questions. Let me ask you this, um, Henry, about um, some of the comments that you've just made. Uh, in this dual society. Is there, in 30 seconds, a way that we can cure it? What, how do, can we live in a shared space when you have a secular people and a people that get up and go to church on Sunday morning and believe it? <laughs> um, when you have two conflicts of worldviews, uh, there's only three or four ways to deal with it. You either separate so that each have their own space, you have one dominate the other, uh, or you have people who come together and form a third new worldview that takes the best from both that both can agree to. Uh, there's really no other way to deal with this. War, you forgot war, number four. But well, no, I didn't forget <laughs> war, but I wanted to be a little optimist. That is, that's the aspect of domination, okay, which but, is, so, so, so you yeah. do one of those three things. Okay. And yeah, right now, I think probably the best way is to create that space. That third. You know, which can either oh, be the two federal, spaces. Or the, well, that's okay. what I mean, it's the two spaces. Okay. Yeah, but ultimately, if we want to be one country, we have to have something that we can agree yes. upon, and that has to be something that represents 
the best of both viewpoints. It cannot be the domination of one. Okay, so that might be where we're going a little bit. I've got my signal that we have to get up out of here. And that's interesting because when you think about the limited role of government, which is what a lot of conservatives and libertarians argue for, it seems like it would clean up a lot of this mess. Much of what we're dealing with in these questions is because government has decided to be in absolute every area of our life, which you're yes. bringing up, Dr. Allen. I really appreciate that. When we come back, we're going to look at another aspect of these same questions because we need to know no, is, this a, is there a left grab for power? Uh, the, the, the second space that um, Dr. Olson was telling us about, where people are trying to dominate others in our society with their worldview. We have to address this because I kind of like number one, you live, I live, I want to go to church, but I want to believe the Bible. I don't want you to arrest me for doing that. And I don't want you to then demand of me uh, to, it, to your worldview. So let's see if we can do that when we get back. Hello, I'm Franklin Graham. Right now, we're in Alaska unloading a hospital for uh, COVID-19. But right now, our country is in trouble, and people are scared, people are afraid, and we see the violence and the injustices that are taking place. Only God can change this. Uh, this is a problem of the human heart, and we have sinned against God, and as a nation, we've turned our back on God. And I want you to know that God loves you, He cares for you, and He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, from heaven to this earth to take our sins. And if we'll confess them and repent, turn from them and believe on His Son, Jesus Christ, God will forgive us and He'll heal our hearts. If you have never invited Christ into your heart, pray this prayer with me right now to say, God, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry, forgive me. I believe Jesus Christ is your Son. I want to trust Him as my Savior. I want to follow Him as Lord from this day forward forever. Amen. Uh, call that number right now that's on the screen. We've got someone who will pray with you, talk with you, and encourage you. God bless. Well, that conversation was pretty lively. I've always felt that the combination of Christianity and capitalism and the Constitution was all we needed for people to live free. But it sounds like some are dominating others. We could end up in a civil war. No, he didn't actually say that, but he did say that. We got We might divide as a society. We'll have Christians over here in red states, and then we'll have blue states doing zones like up in Seattle, I suppose. Does everybody get choice in any of this? Or the third option was kind of just agree to disagree. Maybe we can do that. I don't know. I'm more concerned now about the left's grab for power. This society should perhaps push back. So my very special guest panelist uh, is Mike Gonzalez. He is a senior fellow at the Heritage Foundation. And then I also have my regular rebel panel with me, Dr. William Allen, who is always bringing up lively discussion with us, and our new guest, uh, Dr. Henry Olson. He doesn't want to be called doctor, but I think he's a doctor of the pen. But he's Mr. <laughs> Olson because he's not only an opinion columnist, uh, not just with the Washington Post, but you should read and follow him because he has some very intriguing information and also represents a organization here called the Ethics and Public Policy Institute. I don't think Institute is in Center. the name, though. The Center. Yeah. Uh, it's actually a policy institute, too. But welcome. Welcome Thank back you. to our panel uh, because I want to ask about this column that you wrote, uh, Mike. Mostly in this discussion, we've moved all the way from the Supreme Court is finding things in the Civil Rights Act that, boy, by the time they finish, maybe we should abolish the Civil Rights Act because <laughs> then we might get down to where, hey, it wasn't necessary anyway. It just includes everybody. But you came up with a column that talked about the societal grab for power, that the left is really on, a, on an agenda uh, with what we've seen in the news of late, with the terrorists going through the different communities, now with the pulling down of statues, they don't even know which statues they pull it down anymore. Uh, tell us a little bit about the column, because then I want my other two panelists to comment. Great. No, thank you very much. And the first thing is, can I be a rebel, too? Not yet. We don't know what you're going to say. <laughs> you are a rebel. The fact that I read your column, and I saw that this is really intriguing, and you were pointing out some things that are must read. In fact, it's at the Daily Signal at Heritage Foundation. You must read. I think we posted it also must. on blackcommunitynews.com. But tell us a little bit about what you were saying uh, that got my concern. That's very nice of you. I think we're, what I'm seeing at the moment is that they, they, they left. And by that, I mean the hard left. Mm -hmm. they, they, you know, not not the, right, not not the liberals that we have we, we can talk to. The liberals, but, progressives, right, progressives, right. <laughs> the hard left is now have to, is, is seeing a moment. This is a moment for them to to. And there's a lurch for power. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lurch for power. They want to drive uh, free speech. Obviously, that's the first target. Uh, 
So, so we've seen this in, with the New York Times, the Philadelphia Inquirer. We see this with NBC News trying to get the Federalists deplatformed. We, we, and what, what I believe they want to do is they want to make it uh, impossible for us to be able to discuss real remedies. Right. For example, the success sequence. Uh, that are that are really key to the success of, of all people of all Americans. That's right. That's Not right. just one segment segment of America, but to all Americans. They don't want us to to discuss this if they say, well, no, that's blaming the victim. Right. But let's talk about what that is, that the success sequence, because earlier we talked to Dr. Pat Fagan about family and marriage, right. and once that breaks down, what begins to happen? And so you pointed out, you finish school, take any job, get married be responsible with your choices. So you're absolutely right that there's a problem with that discourse in the public square today, but it seems they're going to extra lengths, uh, as you pointed out in your column, that you kind of recognize this um, totalitarian trend because of some of your work in Asia, I think well, you said. Well, no, I, I mean, I, I've lived in Asia for many years, 10 years, I, and I, which even yesterday, I had a Chinese-American friend of mine send me an email saying, I, I lived during the, the Cultural Revolution. I saw what the Red Guards did. I saw all of this, and, and I am seeing it too. Uh, some people draw comparisons to the, the, the terror in, in, in Paris in 1793. I, the, what I recognize here, I just wrote a book, which I'm about to publish next month, called Encounter Books, The Plot to Change America. Mm -hmm. And this happened in the 60s and 70s, in which the then Eastern white establishment panicked when we had the riots, coast to coast riots. We had close to 700 riots between 1965 and 1971. Mm -hmm. People like me, George Bundy, the head of the Ford Foundation, people like Governor Romney in Michigan, George Romney, they thought that the country was going to be lost, and they accepted a lot of a lot of bad ideas from ideologues and activists who, who really you know intimidated the bureaucracy and intimidated the census bureau and intimidated a lot of people to accept things that actually betrayed the colorblind promise of the civil rights movement well and i think that that's one of the reasons uh, henry i questioned you about the three places that you said could be decision points for us i added a civil war, but we do still battle in the voting booth. But you mentioned maybe this coexistence, but you also mentioned grabbing a little bit from both. What is it that you're seeing is happening in this culture? There is a demand, that number two that you pointed to, that, you know, this insistence that it's our way or no way. Uh, it, it is in every institution, but uh, what was pointed out by Mike's column is in journalism. I mean, this is the fourth estate. This is where we should be able to at least get some semblance of, of honesty, integrity, be able to voice our opinion on the opinion page of a newspaper. I, I'm wondering what you're thinking about. Well, I'm still able to voice my opinion on the opinion page of my you newspaper. You are, uh, and that is shocking. And well, uh, the Washington Post, because uh, they said something about darkness, but I said, well, they got some light in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, if, if, if a society is divided in two, where one side hates another, society cannot be free. That's known as far back as Thucydides, who described this mm -hmm. during the Peloponnesian War. It's what Tocqueville talked about as great parties in democracy in America. Mm -hmm. You know, it's Madison was specifically trying to militate against, and it talked about how representation in the extended commercial republic would remove the possibility of that one versus one, where it's all things or the other. I think the thing that we have to recognize is that the non-discrimination principle is something that is now central to the American public understanding of what it means to be America. Mm -hmm. That we ought not to discriminate against somebody on the basis of irrelevant characteristics. That was not true at the beginning of the founding. You could discriminate under the name of freedom. Mm -hmm. So people on our side need to recognize that that is a part of the new American understanding. That's what I would say is the best about what they offer. Mm -hmm. What they combine that with on the far left is the idea that other things that they want need to be imposed regardless of the opinions of their fellow citizens. That's what the tearing down of the statues is. Right. That's what the mob violence, that's what the thuggery involved with Mao Maoing, you know, uh, as yeah. to use a, a phrase from the past, mm -hmm. these opinion page editors, and that needs to be resisted. That is inimical to a free society mm -hmm. and a good society, and that must be resisted with every ounce of our fiber and people on the center left who may share some of these people's substantive goals but remain committed to America's freedoms. They have to choose 
Why? Which side they're on, the way they did in 1948 when Harry Truman had to decide, are we going to let people who are offensively fronts within the Communist Party take over the Democratic Party? And he said no. He cast them out. He said it then, but now they, it looks like they have. And then to your question about uh, us choosing, I, I don't want lost in the conversation that culture matters and worldview matters. Dr. Allen, yes. I'm a little concerned that it's those that uh, want to adhere to principle that are being asked to set that aside to now live in this new understanding that we can all get along and we shouldn't discriminate. The Bible itself is very discriminating. Yes. Uh, and I don't know, are we being asked to now reject this document that some people believe is truth? Well, we are being asked to reject it, and interestingly, we've been asked to reject it on the basis of lies about it. Whether we start with the 1619 project or go much farther back, take, for example, the easy references to the founders thought Africans were three-fifths of a human being. Right. That is a lie. No. I long ago showed conclusively that it was a lie. But still, people as recently as Marco Rubio or people like Condoleezza Rice or Colin Powell all repeat the lie. I know. In short. It is insidious. The lies meant to dissolve the cement of our civilization mm -hmm. have been widespread. That's why I say black lies matter. These are black lies that are meant to disfigure our histories and to kill our futures. And they are being propagated at an accelerated rate. I think they that's are. what Dr. Gonzalez was describing for us. So my answer to your question is this. Mm -hmm. I'm less sanguine than my dear friend Henry. I don't believe there are three ways. I think there's only one way. Mm -hmm. I think America is lost mm -hmm. unless black Americans save it and wow. rediscover what the principles mean and defend them. Save Without it. that, I don't think the country is going to survive. I, I'm wondering if that same thing, in fact, that's I have concluded that same thing. And I think then when Dr. Fagan talked about family and who better to make this case than the single mom that lived all of these lies. Um, Henry, you, you mentioned de Tocqueville. Yeah, de Tocqueville talked about the freedom and beauty of America, but he also pointed to the church and its role and knew that that was the glue that was able to keep us in a free society. So I want you to think about that um, while I ask Mike another question about what you saw that then you uh, uh, pinned. Uh, in your in your excellent column, that there is now a grab for uh, almost like a force of the people that uh, that want to adhere to these principles and to these truths of the scripture. There's a force for them to live in the back seat, go into the closet that the others came out of. Well, I think that the moment came when a lot of people were very upset when they saw what happened to, to George Floyd and they took to the streets because they were, they were very clearly and rightly repulsed. And then I yeah, think... Yeah, but it was in the middle of COVID. I don't even get to that lie. It no. was in the middle of COVID. You, your roof right. was your own. Go and write a book or right. go and, and, and cry, but no. don't come into the streets. No, no, but my, but point, my point is, is that the, then the, the hard left takes advantage of this, takes advantage of the movement. Don't forget, a crisis is a yeah. terrible thing to waste. Yeah. It's right. still the, the slogan that the left lives by. Right. And, and I think they saw in this, and in fact, Nicole Hannah-Jones and the, 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 the founder of the 1619 Project, she, project. she has a, a, a 9,000 word piece coming out on Sunday, and she writes that she herself is surprised by how fast things are going. Wow. And, and, and the piece is all about asking for reparations, but she says, this is a moment now. This is my, I think we're all living through a moment. We better, we better recognize that we're living through a moment. Yes. And I think that, that the people who think like us have to hold our nerves. Yeah. Have to, have to be, be, able, be able to make sure that America endures with our liberties, right. uh, that, that, that we recognize that some people who are clearly upset, there may be some, there may be some, some reforms that the police departments need to, 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 to have. But America, if, when you say America is structurally racist or institutionally racist or systemically racist, then you have to change all the institutions, all the structures, and all the systems. That's right. And that's what they want. And they think that America is inherently evil, and we just have to turn it upside down and rebuild it, I suppose. And others believe that it's good. Others believe that there is beauty in Christianity and capitalism right. and in a constitution. Right. So, so Henry, I have to ask you then, on this, are, are we too far down the road to not go to this cultural war? I don't know that there's a happy medium uh, between these two sides. Look, They're there fixing their belief. Look, there is a cultural war. And then the question is, uh, do you want to win by dominating and defeating your enemy? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what he wanted. It's awesome now. <laughs> you can't do that and be consistent with America. 
Oh. Because Well, we had a civil war. We did it. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. You had a civil war. So but you know, we might involved, have to be born again it, again. It involved no, killing and it involved the uh, you know, it, it, inv it involved uh, taking away people's rights uh, to vote for a long period of time in the yeah. reconstructed South. And you know, if that's there are people on the right who say in order to defend Christianity, that's what we need to move back to. That's the Christian or Catholic integralist. It program. might have I don't know that they might I'm have not, a choice. I, well, I'm not there. I'm going to defend oh, I'm going to, I'm a Christian and I'm an American and I'm going to defend the political American uh, compromise until it's not possible. Until it's not and possible. And that means See? that I will, I need to defend in a way that is consistent uh -huh. with American principles of equality, dignity, like and that. liberty. Yeah. And uh, the alternative is to install some sort of Christian dictatorship, which is yeah. you know, yeah. what Europe turned to yeah. many, in many countries in Europe in the 1930s. Or, or more freedom. More flexibility. There's I mean, no the, majority the in this have, country for the, that. But there's there, not a majority of even Christian school choice, and Christian. Just, I mean, there should be. Why shouldn't? Why should school we be able to? choice won't solve culture war. It would if people get to just go in those spaces that you mentioned the first time. We have ten seconds. But first, you said, can we coexist? I don't know. We might have to dominate, and then the land gets to rest. Can we coexist in ten seconds? You can't within the corral. We've been corralled, ah. and the tensions inside the corral are only going to get worse until somebody figures out a way to blow it up. Okay. Well, it might be a way to blow it up just by limiting the role of government, get them out of our lives, out of our lives. It was really interesting coming out of COVID, how quickly everybody just wanted more government, more government, more government, and we might have to address that. I'm going to ask my next very special guest about the clergy response to all of this. If the foundations are destroyed, what will the righteous do? when we get back. Today, a student in public school will pray or lead a Bible study. Someone will share the gospel with a lost soul. Today, a pastor will preach boldly the truth of the scriptures without fear of the IRS. The body of Christ will be the salt and light in a darkened world to engage responsible biblical citizens. Today, the life of an innocent child will be saved and a mother will experience the joy of a newborn baby. A distraught woman will find hope and choose life rather than death. Today there is a strong voice defending God's created natural order of marriage and family. There is a defender of freedom in the courtroom and in the halls of Congress and in legislative bodies across the land. Today a young girl by the name of Justina Pelletier will eat dinner with her family and sleep in her own bed. Today all of this is possible because of the Ministry of Liberty Council. People from all over America will find help and hope because of Liberty Council. The adversity they face will be turned into victory, case by case, law by law, Person by person, Liberty Council is advancing religious freedom, the sanctity of human life, and the family through litigation, education, and public policy. In the midst of adversity, there is opportunity to glorify God and to restore the culture. And that is the mission of Liberty Council, to restore the culture by advancing life, liberty, and family. Well, with all of the institutions under attack, it does beg the question, what should the righteous do? Those that get them go to church on Sunday morning and believe the scripture and believe God and look forward to his eternity. Uh, so I have a very special guest to help me answer the question, what should the clergy be thinking about and talking about now that the Supreme Court has decided to expand the Civil Rights Act? I have with me Reverend Mark Little, Esquire, author, columnist, uh, father, husband, and a friend, uh, as well as pastor. So I want to know, Mark, thank you for joining me. And I, it, this soji, as we call it, sexual orientation, gender identity, has been with us for a while. That we've, we've gone through the Lawrence decision that found that the anti-sodomy laws of Texas needed to be overturned, even though they had nothing to do with homosexuality. They were actually just to protect women in marriage if, you know, during time before no fault. And then that opened up the door for the decisions of, of different states to decide that they were going to then have homosexual marriage uh, in the forefront. Then we had a Supreme Court decision, and now we're dealing with sexual orientation, gender identity, to where the House has passed the bill, the Equality Act, the Senate is looking at this bill. Seems like it's putting the church in the hot seat. Uh, what should we be thinking about? What should Christians be thinking about? And specifically, what should pastors be doing now that the Supreme Court has ruled on this? Well, Star, thank you so much for the question. 
because we are, as a church, in a time where we really have to start paying attention. Mm -hmm. The recent Supreme Court case in Bostick, where the Supreme Court has essentially ri written legislation yeah. uh, extending the definition of sex to include sexual orientation. But that is not only a wake-up call that the court is legislating from the bench, but the church needs to understand that this is a continuation of a much larger problem for the church. The court, beginning at least in this, re this past century, with in 1962 with Vitaly V. Engel, took prayer out of public square. And then in 1973, it sanctioned the murder of the unborn, not by the state, but by an individual, right. murdered, sanctioned right. by an individual. And then in 2015, by punting a case, right. it allowed same-sex marriage to enter into our culture. Here's the point. The point is, is that the court, not a legislative branch. Right. Which are elected by the people. Elected by the people. But the court mm -hmm. is a legislating morality right. for the nation. Right. And the church has to be concerned about that. The Bible is the standard for morality. Mm -hmm. And we send our representatives to Congress to reflect our biblical worldview. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering how many of that go to church on Sunday or that even get in the pulpit actually have a biblical worldview. Because as Dr. Fagan pointed out in some of his research on marriage and family, that there's a breakdown of information across the pulpit with the African-Americans being the most churched, but yet the least married, yeah. uh, that perhaps messages of chastity and marriage before children are not coming of the pulpit. You look at the abortion numbers, you look at those now that are participating and practicing publicly in homosexual patterns and lifestyles. Is this recoverable? How, is there a strong uh, church that believes the way, sure. which we know from you know the early church, uh, the, it seems they there's a falling away from this type of truth. Is it still truth? Do people still believe it? Well, it is still truth. Whether they believe it is a good question. We're in a season of moral relativism. Mm. Moral relativism says that if I think it's okay, then it's okay. We have pastors across our nation. Uh, unfortunately, I've, I've advised many of them who are more worried about the offering basket on Sunday. And what we get as a result of that is what's called a seeker-sensitive message. Mm. Pastors nowadays are looking for people to come back the next Sunday. Mm. They want to feel good about worshiping on Sunday. Uh, I remember a time when I was growing up, Star, uh, where uh, we had pastors that said, you're going to burn in hell right. <laughs> if you fornicate. Right. And, and the fear of the Lord was placed in us. So to answer your question in short, for at least the past 25, 30 years, leaders have been praying for revival right. for this very reason, because we have drifted away. We've drifted away from that God that is a God of wrath. Mm. We've drifted away from the God who sees us okay. and convicts us and sees our sin. Yeah. Well, that, and I, I like that word convict, because if you say you haven't sinned, the scripture says we deceive ourselves and we call God a liar, and which I don't want to do. But I also think about my own story, that if someone didn't tell me that this is really wrong, I wouldn't have recognized it and I wouldn't have been changed. So my question is, can we change? Can we cure America by curing the church? Is there still any glimmer of hope that perhaps after COVID closed the churches that some pastors were reflecting and uh, refreshing on why we believe what we believe and why they believe what they believe? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, I believe in our community, we're beginning to stand up for what the Lord says and and uh, uh, and really not care. When you say in a community, yeah. you're now you're talking about African American? Pastor, no, oh, the pastoral, pastoral community. community. Okay. With okay. faith leaders. Okay. With faith leaders. Okay. Uh, there are some of us who are standing up and we're walking mm -hmm. and we're not caring like we used to, perhaps, mm -hmm. about losing the church. I have friends. Well, the offer, I know, well, when you're close, I guess you'd say, well, I guess I lost it anyway. May as well start over. It's a new season, I it believe. It is a new season. I believe it's a new season. Yeah. I believe we are in the planting stage okay. of a new season of pastors standing up for what the Word says All right. on a variety of issues. 
Well, okay. I hope so, because this is getting pretty dark out there. And the ones that are getting hit the hardest by that darkness are those that need the Bible the most. They're the ones that need to hear truth the most. They're the ones that are that need us the most. I can say to you that it feels dark mm. and it looks dark. But I believe the spirit of the Lord is doing something in this season. Mm. I believe that the church is waking up. I believe the first century church is coming back. Wow. Because of the online gatherings and the things that are happening, that people need community. Right. And There's something happening that they in the earth. Community. There's something happening. Okay. And I believe that the Lord is doing a work. I believe he's waking leaders up. Wow. But most importantly, I believe he's waking up the body of Christ, yeah. which, which is what we really need. You know, it was interesting because uh, Dr. Allen brought up on uh, this discussion that it could even be the black community, the individuals, because of the experiences here, because of the, the history that will save America. I'm beginning to believe that as this church community and this awakening of this more churched community, because uh, they still go into the church, uh, and then the awakening that you're talking about, that there could be some truth in, in that this um, would be the person or, or these people groups to say, we can't keep accepting these lies of progressivism. Liberalism has turned into progressivism. It's, it's banked in the Democrat Party where African Americans are disproportioned. And this is not healthy, what we're seeing right now. Do you think that there's some uh, usefulness of the history of African Americans here in this country to be the ones that might ultimately save the country? Well, I think so. And I think we're seeing something happening now, even in that regard. Mm -hmm. uh, as I say in my book, The Prodigal Republican, we have to marry our faith with our politics. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't believe the Bible says that they're separate. God instituted government. And right now, Star, we're witnessing an awakening in the black community from people like Charlemagne the God mm -hmm. and Kanye West and others that are now crossing over from a traditional, I'm going to vote this way because my grandmother did, mm -hmm. to now looking at the issues and beginning to open up their minds and become free think thinkers in a new, very in a very new way. Mm -hmm. And I think to your point, that's what's going to begin to cross over from people who simply are in the mm -hmm. culture and who are simply voting a certain way to now connecting. To connect. The, well, that's the, the beauty of the, the fate of their community. Yeah. To yeah. their vote. To, to the not just to the vote, but to 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 the country. And I, I like I like that, and I love that you brought up that point because we can be born again, and hopefully this time without a civil war. We were born again once before with a civil war. This time, perhaps we'll battle in the voting booth and 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 not have to go down that path again. Mark, yeah. thank you so yeah. much, yeah. Reverend Little, yeah. uh, for bringing that perspective to us about what the clergy can be thinking about and doing uh, during this transitional season. And a few thoughts when we come back. Black Lives Matter is a political movement, and it, it, it arose out of a real concern in the black community. In fact, it's one of the reasons that blacks vote Democrat. When you look at the polling data on safety and security issues, for white and blacks, they're exactly the opposite. Whites trust their local and do not trust the feds. Blacks are exactly the opposite. They trust the, the, the feds and they do not trust the local. We have to ask yourself why? Well, the history. You know, these are different experiences. And one of the challenges that we've had uh, as African Americans is that we have unionized police forces now. For 100 years, the country said, don't unionize your, your public servants. They're public servants. But now they're not. They're unionized employees. So what happens when you put unionized employees, which the nature of unions is that the poor get the rookies and the rebels. And you put that up against broken family life, big guys with a whole lot of energy and no dad to channel it. This is an explosion, and this is what has happened in our society. You put these two together, it doesn't work very well. So there was a concern in black communities when it comes to raising boys. The challenge is, it's politicized. Anytime you don't address a problem, nature so pours a vacuum, someone will fill it, and that's what's happened. So you now have this whole movement of Black Lives Matters that is out to destroy this country as a result of their philosophy. And you have a vacuum on the other side because we don't even talk about it.
The Supreme Court decision to expand Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act to include sexual orientation and gender identity is a formula to expand the chaos that we are already having in our culture today. America must be free, and individuals must be free to choose their behavior. But we undermine our religious freedom and all of our other freedoms when we prohibit private individuals to reject behavior that they find immoral. Our sin is our own. And the Bible tells us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. But when we bring our sin into the public square through endorsements and law, we create an environment for the cultural clashing that we see today, cultural confusion and cultural chaos. This moral chaos is exactly what has caused deep damage in the lives of our nation's most vulnerable individuals and in our most at-risk communities. Rampant abortion, promiscuity, and the collapse of marriage, all of which have caused so much damage in our nation, are the result of moral relativism and secular humanism being incorporated into our laws since the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Senator Tim Scott strikes at the heart of the matter in a recent interview with the Wall Street Journal. He said, if you have two parents in the household, you reduce poverty in the African-American community by 85%. That's a stunning truth that needs more oxygen. Right choices lead to better lives. We need to focus more time and attention on telling the stories of those who have made right choices. A society that cannot distinguish between what God creates and what man chooses is a society that's incapable of being free. This is what our confused Supreme Court, our colleges, and our nation's liberals and progressives are delivering to us. But I thank God that our country is still at least free enough to have elections. Elections give us the opportunity to determine the rules for our public square. My prayer is that the God-fearing in our country, the hundred million that still get up and go to church on Sunday mornings, will exercise this freedom and go into the voting booth to choose life and good that both we and our children may live. I'm Star Parker. I'll see you next week.